Hello, my name is Matthew Bell, and today I want to talk to you about the difference between live on money and leave on money. Live on money would be money that you know you're going to have to need to live, and leave on money would be money you know you're going to be able to pass on. For some people, they may be in a position to know, based on their retirement assets, within a certain range of probability, that they're probably going to need their assets to live on. Another class of people may be in a position to know that there's a certain subset of their assets that they are fairly certain are going to pass on to beneficiaries, to heirs, to charities, to whatever. For some people in between, it may be that they're not sure whether or not they're going to need a certain set, set of their assets to live on or whether or not it's going to be available to leave on. There's going to be a number of factors that are going to go into this kind of a calculation. The first factor is going to be what you actually require to live on. So for example, if you have a million dollars of assets and you have a 5% interest rate on whatever vehicle those assets are in, then you can expect to have $50,000 generated from that $1 million worth of assets. These are all rough numbers. If your living expenses are $50,000 and you're able to generate $50,000 from some asset class based on the interest rate that you're getting, predictably, then you would be able to live off of that money until you pass on and then you would expect that that million dollars would be able to pass on to the next generation. However, if your living expenses are $100,000 and you've got a million dollars of assets, maybe, again, you are able to generate 5% interest. Maybe that you're actually going to run those assets down prior to the end of your life. There can be a number of scenarios in between, and of course, people can have assets well in excess of a million dollars. There is something called a Monte Carlo illustration, and what that sort of is is a probability matrix. It basically has a certain number of factors that are fed in. You basically look at different scenarios, market scenarios, distribution scenarios, and things like that to try and ascertain what probability to assign to complete exhaustion of the of the assets or resources, what probability to assign to the likelihood that there's going to be something left off. From a life insurance standpoint, there's a number of things that can be planned for. If you know that you're going to have to live on assets, you may want them inside of something like an annuity. If you know that you are going to need them as a supplement, maybe to another retirement vehicle, life insurance, whole life insurance, for example, might be a great vehicle for those assets because whole life insurance has both living benefit, cash value, as well as a death benefit, which would of course be the proceeds that are paid out in the event of the death of the insured. If you know that you're going to leave certain assets on, you know that you're gonna leave them on, then some sort of universal life, survivorship universal life may be appropriate because there are certain cases under which if you give up the cash value, you can sort of catapult your premium outlay very much higher in terms of death benefit. So for example, if you knew that you had you have $4 million and you were reasonably certain that a $1 million was going to be left on, there would be a way that you would be able to fund some sort of survivorship universal life with that $1 million dollars in order to generate a much higher death benefit than the million dollars itself. But for a lot of people, they're just not sure. They're not sure whether they're going to need the money to live on or whether or not it's going to be able to pass on to the next generation. In that case, a whole life vehicle can be something of an ideal asset because whole life is going to give you an advantage when it comes to passing an asset on to the next generation. And the reason for this basically is life insurance passes tax-free to the beneficiary. So unlike having assets, let's say, in a qualified retirement vehicle, something like an IRA or a 401k, in an IRA or a 401k, the money that is in that vehicle has never been taxed. So it's either going to be taxed when the owner of that account takes a distribution, or it's going to be taxed when the beneficiary of that account takes a distribution. If the beneficiary on the passing of the owner of that account is a non-spousal beneficiary, then in many cases they have to take that within a certain period of time. Maybe they have a stretch IRA, it might take the, the account down to zero in five years or in 10 years. But the idea is, is any money taken out of a qualified account is going to be taxed. So it's not ideal to pass on. It's designed for retirement. It's designed so that the owner of that account can use that resource in his or her retirement. But once that money passes to the next generation, 
the tax liability can be fairly significant. So contrast that with life insurance. Money that is in life insurance is not tax preferred. There's no benefit, there's no tax break that you get by paying premiums into a policy. But the flip side is when the benefit pays out, when the death proceed pays out, that is tax-free to the beneficiary. So just take a scenario under which a person is going to be in a position of paying, let's say, 30% tax. Let's say they have a million dollars in their in their 401k, and they know that if that passes to a non-spousal beneficiary, their heir is going to be, let's say, in, a, in the position of having to pay 30% taxes, just to keep the math simple. So a million dollars in the 401k, 30% tax means they would pay $300,000 on that money and be able to keep $700,000. Now let's say you knew that that million dollars was going to pass on to your beneficiary. And let's say that in advance of you passing, you went ahead and pulled that money out. Not saying that this would be a good idea to do this, but I'm just as an illustration. If you were to pull your own money out, and let's say you're going to pay the same 30% tax on that money. So you pull a million dollars out, you pay $300,000 in taxes, leaving you with $700,000, which you then put into a whole life policy. So imagine a whole life policy with $700,000 of cash. If you needed that cash, you would be able to withdraw it. You would be able to loan it to yourself. You have access to that cash. But if you do not need it, and assuming you are approximately standard health, it's not uncommon to see a death benefit of the order of twice the premium outlay, which would mean that a whole life policy with $700,000 in cash could pay a million, 1.2 million, 1.4 million, something in that neighborhood if you took that policy out at standard health in your 60s. So that would mean that if you left the money in the 401k or IRA, your beneficiary would get $700,000. But if you put that money instead in a whole life policy, your beneficiary could get 1 million, 1.2 million, 1.4 million, depending on what you qualify for. And that money is tax-free to the beneficiary. You would also have access to that cash. So this is what we mean by a live-on and leave-on combination. whole life policy affords you the ability to pull the cash out if you need it, but it also maximizes or optimizes that cash for transference to the next generation as a, a legacy piece. That could be used for legacy planning for children, grandkids, could be used for charitable donations and, and other things besides. On the other hand, if you knew that a certain amount of cash was going to be left on, then you might be able to even put that into some sort of a universal life, survivorship universal life policy and get an even higher death benefit for your premium out. Depending on how these policies are built, it's going to depend on health, have to qualify. Obviously, this is life insurance, but life insurance can help in any of the three situations, whether you know a certain subset of your assets is going to have to be used to live on, whether you are sure that a certain subset of your assets is going to be left on, or you're reasonably sure, or whether you really are in the middle and you have absolutely no idea whether you might need some of these assets yourself or whether they would pass on. There can be applications for life insurance. Now, let me just bring a brief counterpoint to what I have just stated. I'm going to articulate at least one criticism against the view that I just stated, just for purposes of completeness here. And the criticism, let's develop it by starting with this. If you had $700,000 and what you got out was $1.4 million, let's say over 20 years. I'm just going to use 20 years. Let's say that a person gets this at age 65 and they die at age 85. I'm just making numbers up here. Of course, life policy has to be underwritten. If they're healthier, they're less healthy. All of it's going to affect what actual policy values you see but let's just go with these numbers for the time being. So to calculate the compound annual growth rate, in other words, to try and figure out what rate of return you might think you're getting if you started with 700,000 and you ended with 1.4 million 20 years later, the compound annual growth rate is 3.5%. Just as an exercise then, let's imagine you don't pull the million dollars out yourself. You don't pay the 30% tax. You leave the million dollars in at 3.5%, you would end up with 1.9 million and some change here. You 
can see this is Money Chimp's compound interest calculator. So if you left the million alone and you got a 3.5 rate of return, you'd end up with 1.9 million. However, if you had to pull it all out in this tax environment, and again, no tax advisor or investment person would recommend, I'm sure, that you completely distribute an account that had $1.9 million in it. But if you did, you would pay 37.5% tax, let's just say roughly bringing your $1.9 million down to $1.2 million. So you can see, well, maybe there's a slight advantage to having it in the life policy because with the life policy, you get $1.4 million tax-free, even though here you ended up with $1.9 million after you paid the tax on it, you ended up lower. In fact, in order to get 1.4 million from the 1.9, if you allowed it to remain in the account, your tax rate, effective tax rate, would have to be 29.6 in order for you to get 1.4 million out of it. But the pointed criticism at this point would be the compound annual growth rate is 3.5%. Well, somebody would ask basically, what is the 10 year average return on the S&P 500? And the S&P 500, according to historical records, and this is from Investopedia, this is Google snippet here, the average annual annual return since its inception in 1926 through 2018 is approximately 10%, 10% average rate of return. Now I have an entire video where I'm talking about the difference between an average rate of return and a compound rate of return. And I'm not going to repeat those things here, but let's say just to start the criticism formulated, somebody's going to say, why would I want to have $700,000 earning 3.53% when I could put it into the market and get 10%? And if we think, let's not pull a million dollars out, let's allow it to stay in for 20 years at 10% rate of return, we would have $6.7 million. But of course, an average rate of return annually does not function exactly like a compound rate of return. So the very first point, and I'll only sketch the point here if you want me to make it in more detail, I make it in a different video where I get into the difference between the annual average rate of return and a compound rate of return. But let's just suffice it to say that if you are averaging 10%, some years are gonna do better, some years are gonna do worse, but you're not gonna be able to predict the outcome in terms of the ending balance with accuracy using a compound interest calculator. Now, in addition to that, according to thebalance.com, for the 20 years ending in 2015, the S&P indeed averaged 9.85, that's close to 10%. However, the average equity fund investor earned only 5.19. So if the average investor is only earning 5.19, then one of the things that you might be concerned with is, are you really going to want to depend upon there being a 10% rate of return? But the critic could continue, what would the numbers look like at 5%? Well, at 5%, leaving a million in 20 years, 5%, you'd end up with 2.6. And so they'll still say, look, 2.6 million, even if you had to pull it all out and pay tax on the whole thing, you're still going to end up higher than you would have ended up by taking the money out yourself and putting it into a whole life policy. Now, let me make two final points about that. The first point is, and this is according to Dalbar, Dalbar's quantitative analysis of investor behavior. And this point has been repeated on a number of different websites, but Dalbar, when they surveyed a 30-year period of return. And the S&P during that 30-year period averaged 11.11%. If you can see it in here, the S&P averaged 11.11% over a 30-year period of time. However, the average equity fund investor only returned 3.69%. 3.69% is awfully close to 3.53 that we had here in the life policy. And with the life policy, the, there was no market volatility. I mean, this is a whole life policy. You might get volatility if you put it into a variable product or if you put it into an equity index product and you might get some potential upside. In other words, I think this life policy illustration is almost the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is you're going to be basically hovering around 3.53%, but you don't have market volatility. And according to Dalbar, if you put it in the market, even during a stretch of time where the market averaged over 10%, the average equity fund investor, according to their research, did horribly compared to that, only bringing in 3.69. And that means that your rate of return is going to be on a par with what you've gotten in the life policy, except after you're still gonna to have to pay tax. And so the final point I suppose that I would make on it is even if you think you can get a higher rate of return in the market, and many investors will, there's no question the market can return a higher amount. There's a couple of considerations that still might prompt a person to want to err on the side of some kind of a conservative vehicle, some kind of life policy or cash accumulating vehicle that does not expose them to the market. And the first reason is they wanna avoid market risk. They don't want 
the potential downside. They don't want to end up losing their principal. They just want it in a conservative instrument. The second reason is a number of these calculations is dependent on tax rates staying where they are. So let's say you got the average investor's return. You change it 5.19. So you end up with $2.75 million after 20 years. Well, if your tax rates go up, let's say taxes are increased in the future. Let's say instead of then paying 30% tax now, your heirs may end up having to pay 50% tax in the future. If you pay half in tax, then it would leave 1.375. And my point in saying that isn't to say that I know that that's going to happen, but for some people, they think even if I end up with a better rate of return, and those numbers look really attractive, 2.75, who wouldn't rather have 2.75 million instead of 1.4 million? And yet in the life policy, 1.4 million goes to the beneficiaries income tax free. Whereas even if you were able to accumulate 2.75, if tax rates are north of where they are now, your heirs could conceivably end up with a lot less and possibly even at 50% tax, which is not historically out of the realm of possibility, they might end up with less than what they had in the life policy, even with a higher rate of return of about 5.19 annually. So just a couple of considerations. Obviously, I don't know what the future holds. I can't say definitively. I'm not trying to push you in one direction or another. It's just these are some of the things that occur to me. I am not in a position to be able to advise you. I cannot give you recommendations. I cannot take information and give you a tailored recommendation. So if any of these ideas are of interest to you, I would encourage you to reach out to some sort of licensed life insurance broker or agent in your area and talk through some of the options by collecting a little bit of information about your situation and about your expectations about what you want to have in retirement, what you expect to need to live on. A, a properly trained agent will be able to help to give you product and idea recommendations as to how these ideas might be able to apply to your family's situation. I appreciate your time. I thank you very much. If anything that I've said today has been of interest to you, I would ask that you would simply uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel. I'll have additional content. I'm not endorsing any of these ideas necessarily or saying that they're going to be a correct fit for you or your family, but it's some things that are out there in the realm of possibility. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope that uh, something that I've said has been of some use to you.